Thank you very much. And thank you for coming, even though there's soccer outside. <laughs> very brave. Um, I want to talk about evolving KDE. How many of you have actually heard of KDE? Almost everyone. Amazing. So, um, KDE started with this email. New project, cool desktop environment, programmers wanted. That was what Matthias Edrich sent out in 1996 um, to start a new desktop environment for Linux for end users. And it should be a GUI because there were a lot of command line things already. And he was very explicit about what he wanted to do and what he wanted to have and who he wanted to build it for. He wanted to build it for somebody who wants to browse the web with Linux write some letters, and play some nice games. Um, and that was what drove KDE's development for a very long time. We had KDE 1, and KDE 2, and KDE 3. That was around the time when I joined KDE. And at that point, um, we reached a really stable system. We had a lot of users who really liked what we were doing. So at that point, we said, we have to get um, all the technical depth that we have done and all the changes that are done in our underlying toolkit um, and basically make a lot of really fundamental changes so we're ready for the future, which brought us to KDE 4. Um, now, some of you might know that was technically excellent in terms of how our users perceived it. Unfortunately, not so much. Because a lot of the things they have learned to love about KDE went there in KDE 4.0. And we added them back um, through the, the releases that came after that. So we had a, an excellent technical base and a an excellent desktop environment a lot of programs around it, like Krita, our natural painting program, Marble, our desktop globe, and many, many more. Um, so in some way, we had reached what Matthias Edrich set out to do in 1996. Around the same time, we also moved our um, version control system from SVN to Git. So before that, we were all in one big uh, SVN repository, everyone was committing to everything, one shared space. In Git, that was very different. And Conway's law says that if you split up your infrastructure like that, your community will split up like that too. And surprise, this is exactly what happened. Um, <laughs> so we had this problem that it didn't feel like one cohesive community anymore. On top of that, the world around us was clearly changing. People were using mobile phones more, smartwatches, personal assistants, lots of things were moving into the cloud. Everyone wanted to start their own startup and get filthy rich. And desktops just weren't a cool new thing anymore. All of this together meant that we no longer had really compelling answers when people ask, why are we actually here? Why are we doing this? What keeps us all together as one community? And why should anyone join? That isn't to say there weren't reasons for that, right? There totally were. There were answers for that, but they were very fuzzy, and it got harder and harder for us to articulate them. That brought quite some issues with us, um, with it for us. A lack of guiding principles meant that um, we lacked a base for a lot of the decisions and discussions we were having leading to community issues. Um, a lack of a common vision we could strive for after we've more or less solved the first one we had. And that, of course, means we had a lot hard time recruiting new people. Because um, if we can't tell someone why they should join, that's not a good sign. And our public perception still was um, suffering from KDE4. 
And at that point, um, a lot of people in the community f uh, felt that something had to be done. And that's why we started Evolving KDE in 2015, with the goal to bring clarity to the question, where are we, where do we want to go, and how do we get from here to there? It started at, um, <clears throat> in April 2015 with announcement, hey, we need to talk about these questions and we need to find answers to those questions. And we did a survey. Um, and after a while, we published the survey results and some uh, recommendations based on that survey. And I presented that at, an, at a keynote in our annual conference, and we discussed about those. Parts, or the results of that survey basically said, we have a great community. There were quotes in the, in the survey answers like, there's a sense of working for the greater good that drives the community. It is welcoming and friendly and able to integrate people from very different backgrounds and cultures. For me, it represents the ideal of what a free software community should be. So people really saw something very valuable in our community. People are very proud of our technology. And people cared a lot about the impact they could have while contributing to KDE. Um, they cared about fr giving freedom to our users um, because they thought, unlike Ash my friend Ashish on his t <laughs> with his t-shirt that says, I wasn't using my zero rights anyway, they thought, no, I want to use my zero rights. I want to have freedom and need the technology to be able to exercise that. Um, and a lot of people of course, wanted to scratch their own itch, fix something that bothered them, solve a problem for themselves. And KDE has always been a community that welcomes new people and um, learning, trying things out, mentoring, and everything around that. So those were the things that people valued. Um, oh, yeah. <coughs> um, and for example, someone said, the wide variety of people involved in the past years, it did teach me to see the world in different ways. And I think that really puts it in a nice way, what KDE means to, to someone. <clears throat> and we also asked people, like, what's, what's keeping you from contributing more to KDE? What's keeping you from enjoying it more, and so on? And as I think in every free software project, the biggest thing was time and energy. Um, it was hard for people to find the time to contribute as much as they would like to. Another thing was <coughs> sorry, um, skills that they didn't have or think they didn't have, a lack of tutorials to get those skills, um, and unclear entry points for them. And the biggest thing, a lack of vision, strategy, and focus for the community that we could orient ourselves towards. Someone, for example, said, um, while we're not always moving in the same direction, we always want to move forward. On the one hand, that's great, but also not. <laughs> um, and it's kind of um, sad that we weren't able to channel that energy in a direction that benefits everyone who is using our software. So what we did was tackle exactly that problem first. Um, write down, and before that discuss, of course, um, what our vision actually is. And we started um, that discussion in August 2015, um, and that uh, went on until April 2000, uh, 2015, and went on until April 2016. And the outcome of that is a world in which everyone has control over their digital life and enjoys freedom and privacy. This is what we want to strive for. This is what we want to provide to our users. Now, it took us some time to get to this, but um, this was still relatively easy to get agreement on because it was high level enough for people to see themselves in this. 
and, and see this as what we've been doing for a long time. Um, but at the same time, people are like, okay, that's great and helpful, but we need something more concrete now. Um, how do we turn this into something that's actually actionable? So we started working on our mission and started brainstorming around that. And that was the most difficult part of the process because this was the level where people really cared and where it was concrete enough for people to say, no, I don't think that's what we're doing, actually. We should talk about that. <clears throat> and, and people were understandably very attached to what they were thinking. Um, and one of the things that we saw happening was that we, that people were talking a lot about from their own experience and from their own thinking around this without us being able to say, this is what the larger community and our users think. So we did another survey with questions more geared towards um, what we wanted for the mission and used that as a basis for continued drafting of the mission. Um, and under the BOF at Academy, our annual conference, to kind of wordsmith that um, to a state where we were kind of happy with it, but not really. And everyone had a little thing in it that didn't feel right. Um, and at that point, and that's also, I think, the point where that I regret most in the process, um, we let it sit for way too long without pushing it forward because it was <coughs> such a hard position to, to move forward from. Everyone kind of didn't thought it didn't feel right, quite right, but it was also hard to, to move away from that. Um, and in May 2017, we sat down at a board meeting, an extended board meeting, where the board and a few other people uh, met and looked at it again and said, like, this isn't actually so hard um, after we looked at it several months later. Um, and we split it into a part that is actually mission and a part that is strategy. And that solved a lot of our issues. Um, and then we discussed the remaining points at the next academy and um, closed the discussion. But as you can see, it took us over a year for this whole thing and that was way too long. <laughs> um, right, and the outcome of that is, uh, is this. I'm not gonna read all of this now. Um, and I'm actually quite happy with it. And again, it, it becomes more concrete and people have more to hold on to. But again, people ask, okay, but what do I do today? What, how, how do I put that into action today? Fair question. We started talking about goals. Um, and what we did was um, tell people they can propose goals, they have some time to draft them, of what people should, or what KDE as a whole, should rally behind for the next three to four years. Um, anyone could come and uh, propose a goal in our fabricator and um, discuss it with other people, refine it, have people join and, and express interest and so on. And then we, uh, had a vote with everyone who has a contributor account. Um, and in November 2017, we had three winning goals that were selected. And this is what the Fabricator board looked like. And these are the goals. Um, in short form, or short form uh, top, -notch, top notch usability and productivity for basic software, basically fixing all the small annoying things people keep asking for. Um, privacy software, giving people better tools to um, improve the privacy of their system and um, respecting their privacy um, more and so on. And streamlined onboarding of new contributors, so lowering barriers of entry, adding lots of um, documentation, all these kinds of things that help people get into the community. And 
<coughs> the good thing, or the really cool thing that I didn't expect um, that happened is that um, of those three goals, two were proposed by people who hadn't been part of the core community before, but who were new people. And um, those are the two who really are driving their goal and, and getting people involved, and that's really cool. So, what did it get us? Of course, this whole thing didn't fix everything, but it gave us um, direction, it gave us more community cohesion and engagement. Um, we have great new people joining us, and our public perception looks a lot, <laughs> a lot better today than it did a few years ago. And um, we have companies, communities, other projects uh, interested in partnerships with us because we can talk about what we're doing much better and why we're doing it. Now, not all of that, of course, came from this process, but I believe a lot of that was really helped um, with that. Lessons learned. Um, it was a, not an easy process, I have to say. Um, and I learned quite a lot. And I, uh, one of the things is, um, in order to go through that with a large community, you need to have a sense of urgency and pain in that community. They need to um, see that there is a problem and that they want to fix it. Um, otherwise, this is futile. Um, Over-communicate and over-involve. Um, there's a saying, if you're not sick of hearing your own message, you haven't talked about it often enough. There is something to that. Um, be ready to put in the work and follow through. This is a lot of work, and if you're starting a process like that, um, you can't stop halfway, because people will be very upset and uneasy, and you're leaving the project in a, in a limbo state where it doesn't really know where to go from there. Don't do that. Um, and it really helps to have a trusted group of people you can bounce ideas off and you can get feedback, get feedback from and to tell you truthfully what's working and what's not. Another thing that I learned is that you have to be really clear of what you mean when you say mission, vision, strategy, and all these words, because everyone understands them differently. And these subtle differences mean a lot of communication and issues in that communication for no good reason, because people misunderstand the level you're talking on and so on. Um, and it's really important to listen to people's fear that come up in these processes. Um, so for example, there was a lot of fear in our discussions around, oh, are we abandoning the desktop now? Are we abandoning what we've been doing for more than 20 years? And it's, it really helps to dig into that and understand where that fear is coming from and how you can address it. Um, another thing that was super helpful for us was to get data. The two surveys we did really helped to get away from a lot of, I think the community thinks this, or I know everyone thinks this. No, do the survey and um, have data that you can talk about and reliably um, have. You have a question. Which Sorry? Which survey tool? Um, Lime survey is what we used. F um, both for the surveys and the vote at the end. Um, <coughs> yeah, and be ready as, uh, to adapt as you go. Um, this didn't work out as I had planned it initially, but that was okay. We adapted as we went along. And um, I hope some of you will join us, all of you will join us, um, because we have our vision now, we have our goals, and um, we welcome uh, new contributors to join us, make them real. Thank you. <laughs> Do we have some time for more questions? Maybe one question or two, but not really much time. Yes? Uh, hi. Uh, I was wondering uh, about how many people were involved in that process at the various stages? 
So the, um, the initial survey for, um, <coughs> for evolving KDE, I think, uh, was taken by two to 300 people. Um, the vote emails went out to, I think, about 500, and about um, one third to half of them actually uh, voted. And I got a lot of emails from people saying, oh, thank you that you're reaching out to me, um, because they hadn't heard from KDE in a very long time, but they still had an account. And so I think we might even have reactivated one or two people through that, which was cool. Um, uh, the question I had is, so, you know, given that you did this exercise in mapping out what uh, the uh, top priorities were, uh, what are some of the areas that uh, KDE is targeting in terms of new features and platforms? Um, so, right now we're working on, uh, for example, Plasma Mobile which is an uh, um, interface for mobile phones, an adaption of our desktop, basically, um, which was one of the things that was made possible with all the work we've done for KDE4, <laughs> um, and which is now paying off. Um, same for, for tablets, of course, and so on. Um, we also have a group of people who are looking into the automotive space, for example. Um, yeah, so those are currently two areas we are, we're looking into. And of course, continuing to provide a good desktop because I think today that's even more important than it ever has been um, since this is a desktop that cares about your privacy, about you being able to change it in the way you want it, and so on. Giving you the control over it. Does that become, does that become KDE Lite then? the mobile version or is it because uh, you know there is a lot of uh, interest in uh, a light version that you can actually run on different devices yes um so no there is no kde light what we have done is actually make kde's software lighter and it's now running on really um cheap and low key hardware okay thank you again lydia thank um, you very much <laughs>